We're sisters, best friends, and authors on a mission to help you stoke your creative fire and live the life of your dreams. We believe that purpose fuels passion and that creativity is your secret weapon for mass construction. There's never been a better time to bless the world with your dream realized. You're listening to The Kate and Abby Show. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Kate and Abby Show. Today, we are talking about writing better fantasy. And we're super excited for this topic because we've had a lot of requests for more topics on fantasy writing because a lot of you guys are fantasy writers. And Kate is a fantasy writer. She's been writing fantasy pretty much for your whole writing career. Yeah, I've just gotten into it over the past few years Mm -hmm. with writing this urban fantasy series that we're working on together, co-write. So we have learned a lot about fantasy, writing fantasy, over the years, and we're really excited to dive into this topic. We're just going to share some of our best advice, best tips that we've learned over the years through the writing process, through growing and learning as we write fantasy, and finding what are those most important things that stand out from the rest of all the advice you see on writing fantasy. What are like the most a important lot things out there? Yeah, it can be easy to get overwhelmed. Yeah, you need to know, like, what are the few, the vital few things that you need to really focus on. Um, So yeah, that's, that's what we're discussing today. Super excited to get into this topic. It's going to be a good one. So make sure you have a notebook nearby to take notes. Um, But before we get started, we have a few things to mention. And first and foremost, that is the amazing supporters who make this show possible. We love you guys so much. The Patreon community is what keeps this show alive and keeps it free of interruptions, no ads, no sponsorships. If you like that and appreciate that about this show, we definitely support and appreciate you guys helping us to make that possible. So thank you so much for our amazing patrons over on Patreon. And if you get value out of this podcast, consider joining the Patreon community at patreon.com slash the Kate and Abby show. And you also get a chance to hang out with us every yes. single month live when you join the Patreon at any tier, which we just did our first hangout for February. Yes. And um, it was like, what, last week? Last week? Yeah. It was amazing. You guys um, hopped on and we were able to just have this fun group discussion and answer a lot of questions. And it was just like, we tried to make it as fun and organic as possible, just like us sitting around having coffee together so it was it was really fun we just got such great energy out of it and um we hope you guys did too because i think we all had a lot of fun with that discussion so we're going to keep doing those every single month so if you want to be part of those exclusive live discussions you can join the patreon at any tier and you'll get access to those live um video video calls basically yeah or live, live streams, streams, rather. Yeah. <laughs> that was the word I was looking for. Yes. They're, live streams. They're a lot of fun. They feel yeah. kind of like a video call because it's they like do. only, you know, a small group. They're really interactive. So, yeah, yeah. We, we get to answer a lot more questions and talk with you guys a lot more one-on-one. So Yeah, it's, it's a lot um, different than when we just go live on YouTube. Yeah. Um, because it's more of a, like, intimate group setting. So yeah. it's really nice. Yeah. It is. It's fun. So... Go to patreon.com slash the Kate and Abby show to get in on that if you want to join the monthly live streams and also help support this show. Um, One last thing before we get started, and that is this beautiful candle you see mystically flickering behind us goes with the fantasy mood. And it's a special candle because Kate made it. Yeah, It came from Kate's Etsy shop. It did. So how can how can our listeners get these amazing mystical candles? They smell so good. Yeah, they do smell. And good. they have like crystals and herbs. Like, like explain how you yeah. make them because so, it's so cool. <laughs> so this one's the writer's ritual candle, and it's great for burning if you're writing fantasy or world building because it has a labradorite crystal. It has mugwort and sage, and it's just this incredibly really like herbal, earthy fragrance designed also with some frankincense in there. It's designed to help you focus and tap into that inner creativity. And we also have three different, three other types of candles. One's like myth and magic for crafting magic systems. One is for creative sessions, invigorating like citrus and herbs. And there's one for a rest day, which is like more like relaxing tones of lavender. And each one has a crystal that we've chosen. My husband and I make all of them by hand 
So it's a great way to not only support what we're doing, but it's really fun to bring into your writing space, light a candle and make a little ritual out of sitting down to write. That's one of the things that I've always done is lit some incense, which we have too, incense for writers, or write or light a, a candle. And that helps me to just create this fun, relaxing atmosphere to write in. So that's what that's where the writer's ritual candles came about. And this one, Burning Great Pandas, is the writer's ritual original candle. And you can find all the ones I talked about on my Etsy shop with the link in the description of this video. If you're listening on some other platform, you can find that video on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash KMNs. So all the info will be down in the description. But yeah, it's yeah. been so much fun. It's been yeah, so cool to explore It's been different really sense. cool to see you making all the different ones. I've, I've been the recipient of a few custom made candles and they're yeah. just so beautiful and such a great presentation and all the different herbs and um, essential oils really like uh, have different purposes, right? right? For creativity, for focus. And so <clears throat> it's actually like, it's, it's helping your productivity exactly. too. Exactly. <laughs> Cause I know you, you like writing, you like lighting a candle yes. when you're like sitting down to write yeah. or work at your desk. It, it helps at the mood. It does. Sure. Help. It's, it helps at the mood. It's like super cozy. And then like the essential oils do different things. It can help yeah. with your focus. It can help lower stress. So mm. it's just an, it's a nice addition yeah. and it helps to, um, I find it helps to make me more mindful about my writing when I like set up my space yeah so just, it, it helps for yeah, sure it sets the tone for yeah sure. so check out kate's etsy shop lots of amazing unique stuff over there definitely check it out and show kate some love and also the show if you're um if you're a listener of the show it's it's a great way to connect better with mm -hmm. us it is. so yeah check that out link in the description box below this video um but let's get into the discussion. Yeah. So F writing better fantasy. Writing better fantasy is a huge topic, but I, you and I have talked so much about it over the past um, years, really. Yeah. <laughs> over years and years, like just all of the little details that that add up to a lot in, yes. the, end, in the big picture. Um, but I think first and foremost, like I noticed that when I when I've done research for videos and just kind of looked around on different articles and blogs and see what people are talking about, whenever you look around for advice on writing fantasy, the things that I always see are like, create a magic system, create a um, unique world, mm -hmm. with like different countries and cultures and, and histories and politics and, um, you know, create maps and like <laughs> consider geography and like all those things are fine but they are not really the story you know mm -hmm. they can serve the story but the story is really has to start with the characters right and fantasy is the same as any other genre in the way that it has to in order to be really compelling and emotional it has to start first and foremost with your characters being the centerpiece mm -hmm. and their internal conflict and yeah, then exactly. expanding from there. Because we can start to look at fantasy as two, like it's this whole different genre all by itself. Yeah. And like you said, it's like writing any other type of story. Right. We're starting with the characters and then we're building the world out from there. And we do have a previous episode, which I think was the episode we did about Narnia specifically. Mm. It's actually, a, yeah. it was one of the first episodes we did of this podcast, but really, really good. So go check it out if you haven't. But we talked about how in the Chronicles of Narnia, um, C.S. Lewis kind of utilized this exact formula with, um, I don't really like to really call it a formula, but like the structure. Mm -hmm. it, it was this structure with like when Lucy discovers Narnia. It's not like we hear about Narnia first. We meet the main characters first. And then as they right. start to discover things, our world expands and expands and expands through the eyes of the main character. Yeah. So I think that is such a valuable way to start a story mm. so that your reader is deeply connected with your main characters and in deep point of view in a way. Mm. Yeah, so true. I talked about the same thing in my uh, world building video that I did several years ago using Narnia as the example and how when Lucy first enters Narnia, we only see like what she immediately sees mm -hmm. and then we leave and then we come back and we see a little bit more and then we leave and then we come back and then we start to see the whole world. But right. it's like, it's it's the magic and the rules, the culture, the history, all of that is like 
it's discovered and unveiled as the characters discover it. Right. And that helps you, like you said, to have this deep point of view and, and feel like you're in the skin of the character. And, and really, just like with navigating real life, that's, you know, an unfantastical uh, world, you are experiencing the things that matter to you as a person, you know? Right. And if something is not immediately impacting you or your personal reality, it's really not part of your consciousness it's not part of your internal narrative you don't notice it um, unless it's coming into your world and affecting you coming into your space so considering that and you can still like do all this world building you know and all of the if you if you like making maps and sketching out like different countries and their histories and politics and their relationships with each other that's fine to do that <laughs> but be very mindful about where you introduce those things in the story itself. Yeah. Um, because a lot of times I've noticed with, with some fantasy books I've started reading and a lot of times did not finish because of this reason, um, it's that I feel like I'm reading the author's notes on just like every idea they had for this world and they just start laying it all out and it's so much information. It's just information overload. And I can't grasp it because I'm taken out of the mind of the character that I'm supposed to care about. And I'm shown so much that I can't connect it to something that matters emotionally to me. Right. And it's just like this information overload. You feel like you're just like reading a Wikipedia page about this world, you know? And that can be cool to have something that's so richly developed that it feels like it's always existed. That is the goal. But keep all that dense information in your notes and your outlines before deciding where it should be introduced in the narrative of the main characters, you know? Mm -hmm. yes. And this is something that I think practice helps you to sort of gauge what feels good for that. Like when it starts to feel like, okay, we need some information. We need a little bit, bit of exposition here. But even trying to find areas where you can show through action Mm -hmm. is way better than stopping to tell me what what this thing is or, you know, the history of something or the culture of something. If it's not directly impacting the main character, why do we need to know about it right now? <laughs> That's a good question to ask yourself. If it is directing, directly in, impacting the main character, how so? And how is it impacting them emotionally? That would be, I think, the more important question to ask yourself rather than like just the physical impact it has on them. Like what is the emotional impact of this cultural thing or something to do with the magic or something to do with the world? And so there are different ways to do this, obviously, and d a lot of different examples of this. But notice it when you're reading books, notice it when you're watching films, when something happens that directly impacts the characters and you can see how it emotionally affects them. Like, what is that thing? And how, how did the writer weave it into the story in a seamless way that made you still care about the characters and not feel like you've been detached from the characters to learn this information? Right. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and gauging when does that information become important? Mm -hmm. Because is it vital that we know all of that right at the beginning of the story? That's a format that is pretty common to see in a lot of fantasy films and books where it's like you enter the story and immediately there's a lot of information to process. But most of the time, it's not important for us to know all of that at the very beginning. So I think it can be a good question to ask yourself and maybe even write out some questions and just glance at them as you're going through your notes and as you're going through your first draft. You know, do I need to know this at this point in the story? Or could I reveal this later through dialogue or like Abu was saying, through action with the characters? Do I need to deliver all of this in exposition through narration? Do I need to reveal all of it right now? Or can I sort of pepper it throughout? And a lot of times that ends up feeling more realistic to me. And, and I know a lot of this can be a matter of opinion. So take all of this with a grain of salt and, 
and try things out for yourself. See what works for you. That's what we're always encouraging you guys to do is, is just try different things and see what is working for you in your writing style because we can't tell you like what's going to jive with you the best, but what we always encourage writers to do is to question the the basic format that you can sometimes be encouraged to march down this road of this is how everyone writes a fantasy novel or this is how you world build. Here's the rules for a magic system and question that and try going your own way and ask yourself, you know, do I really need to do all of this right now? Or can I find different, more innovative ways to incorporate that? And that's a lot of times what's going to cause your book to stand out to a reader is yeah. the fact that it will be different. You don't need to feel pressured to go the same route that every other author has gone. Yeah, that's that's something that <laughs> is definitely a big thing with fantasy, I think, is that a lot of writers feel like, a lot of new writers especially, feel like, okay, I have to make this really unique, really original, complex fantasy world and plot and magic system. And you don't. <laughs> like, you don't have to make it original because the thing is this, like, originality is so subjective because everything's kind of been done before in different ways. And so if you if you put all of your hopes in making this thing so original, so unique, nobody's ever done this quite like this before, and then something comes along or you see something or you read a book that it has a lot of the same elements, you're going to be disappointed and feel like, oh, my thing's not original enough now because, you know, I didn't... I didn't realize that somebody else had already done something similar. It doesn't matter. First of all, a lot of times when people do something similar, it's because there's like actually a subgenre and there's a huge audience that likes this particular thing. So it might actually be a good idea to have some similarities, something to think about. Another aspect of this is that putting your hopes in making something based on somebody else's expectation or standard of, of what it should be is not a good reason to do it. Like the best reason to write a book the way you're writing it is because you want to read this book. Like if you were walking through a bookstore and you saw this book that you're trying to write, what would make you feel like, oh, this is the exact kind of book I've always wanted to read. This is the exact kind of story I've always wanted to have in my life. And a lot of times, intrinsically you know exactly what that is like it's, it's different for everyone but like you and I kind of are doing that with our co-write series right um and we've had a lot of different inspiration from various sources and a lot of original ideas but kind of wove together this world and these characters into this series that feels like the series we've always wanted to read, you know? Yeah, exactly, yeah. And it has a lot of things that we've, we've always loved, a yeah. lot of elements we've always loved. Really years of discussion. Yeah. Years of dreaming and yeah. talking, pitching back and forth ideas about like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if there was a book like this or if there was a plot like this and characters mm -hmm. like this? And that slowly culminated into this series that we're writing yeah. together. Yeah, so, so that's really special to be able to yeah. find those sources of inspiration and bring it all together into this unique thing that's like, I've always wanted something like this. It's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's flavored kind of like this, has this vibe, and it's, you know, but it's completely different in this way. Like, right. what is that thing, you know? Yeah, and, and also keeping in mind that people who enjoy reading a certain thing are probably looking for more books like that. Yeah. That's why in book marketing, you'll see a lot of... Um, advertisements or articles about books that will say, if you like this book and this book, you'll like right. this book. Yes, exactly. Now, no one's like, oh, well, if it's like those, then it should never have been written. <laughs> it's like, oh, good. I really liked that book. Yeah. I would probably... So exactly. It, it's, it, look at it as a positive. It doesn't need to be totally original. Um, as long as you're not on purpose right. copying someone's work. Right. Like, obviously, don't plagiarize it. Right. <laughs> We're saying, though, like... If you're like, oh, that I just realized that my magic system's kind of similar to like this movie I just saw. Like now I feel like I shouldn't write. It's like go watch Abby's story smoothie book. I yes. book not book video. The story yes. smoothie book video. Like yes. where you're talking about how you can gain inspiration from other things. Right. And even if like there, you can probably think of a dozen books right now that you've read that have similar aspects and that doesn't yeah. mean those authors shouldn't have written them. There are lots of stories that are similar to each other 
And that can yeah. be looked at as a positive because there's there's an audience for certain genres and they really get excited when it's like, oh, good, another dragon book. Oh, good, another vampire book, whatever, fill in the blank. Yeah. So don't feel discouraged if you feel like you're in a saturated genre. And I think that's, uh, this is also something worth, sa- worth saying is if you have someone in your life who is telling you, oh, that's a really oversaturated genre, you shouldn't write that. You should try to find some other genre that's less saturated. Don't ever try to like, push yourself into a genre that you don't even want to write and abandon the one that you really want to write just because you feel it's oversaturated. Yes. If if that if you want to pour if you are like, man, I want to pour my heart and soul into this book and I love this genre, even if it's quote unquote oversaturated, just do it. Because the love and passion you're going to give that story is what will cause your readers to love it. And thankfully in today's world, we have more opportunities now than ever to be able to market directly to our readers, reach our readers in really meaningful ways. And a lot of times oversaturated markets are oversaturated for a reason because there's a lot of hungry readers there. Mm -hmm. And there's absolutely no reason to believe that they wouldn't absolutely love your work too. Yeah, a hundred percent. So true. It's so true. And that's, that's something that is, I think, very inspiring when you start to write something that's, you know, and that you've seen, you maybe have seen a lot of it because you can put your own unique twist on it by making it something that only you could write. It's, it's about bringing something to the topic, bringing something new to this space of writing that only you could create. Right. And, and you're using different sources of inspiration. You're using your own unique ideas to put your own unique spin on it. And that's always so, so much better than copying what someone else has done or like copying the standard fantasy model, whatever that may be to you. Um, so yeah, trust your gut and rely on your own instincts and just write what you want to read. <laughs> like if you yeah. could, if you could create your ideal fantasy book and snap your fingers and be able to read it, what would it be? And go write it. Like it's really that simple. Um, and as far as the world building, the magic system, things like that, that you feel like have to be very richly developed and very complex and layered. A lot of times you don't have to figure that out like right out of the gate, especially if it's something that you want to be more complex later on. It may come to you and become more complex as you write. So, and, and as speaking as an outliner, I understand the struggle of like, you know, an intense plotter <laughs> wanting to make sure that you have all your ducks in a row, all of the maps and the myths and legends and the cultures, religions, politics, all of it sorted before you start the first draft. But that might actually like take some of the joy out of it for you. So don't feel like you have to prepare all this material ahead of time before you can start making characters experiencing the world. Characters experiencing the world may help to create that layered world. You know, you've experienced this a lot, I think, with writing your fantasy book. Yeah, Because your, your fantasy book that you're still working on is so layered and rich, and it feels like it's a world that has existed forever. Like, yeah. so many different cultures and different character groups, and it's just so richly developed, but you didn't write, like, a bunch of backstory and, and, and outlines and plot for it before starting the first draft, right? It kind of just, you were like visualizing and it was coming to you as you were writing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That was definitely the process for me was a lot of it was developing itself as I wrote. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's great about writing a book is you can always go back and add things. You know, this is your first draft. You can go back and add stuff. And that's what we found too, writing our co-written series is we've developed things, I feel, more and more as we've gone. And then we're like, oh, okay, yeah, let's go back and enhance this more. Or let's take this element and go back and, you know, weave that in in a stronger, more meaningful way. So I think that's important because sometimes if you plan too much at the outset, it also becomes overwhelming to think of writing. Like, oh, wow, I have to include all this stuff rather than seeing how would this naturally weave its way into the story Mm -hmm. and then I can always go back and I can make notes like okay let's insert that here here and here yeah and I think that can also help from a reader's perspective like you're almost um experiencing the fantasy world from a perspective of a person who doesn't fully know about it yet which is what your reader is 
And I think sometimes when you do too much plotting and world building ahead of time, it can make you lose that reader's perspective of like, I know nothing going into this. <laughs> and I don't even know how to describe this. Like, I've just experienced it in books before where it's like the, the writer, it feels like the writer is just assuming I know everything and they're mentioning all this information in a way that I feel so disoriented because they're, they're writing almost from the perspective of someone who knows everything, which they do, um, and not from the reader's perspective who knows nothing. Mm -hmm. And although the characters that are telling the story, the character's narrative, the character's point of view, they should obviously know whatever they're supposed to know as characters. But you have to consider that the reader is very disoriented going into it, opening on page one. They don't know anything yet. So coming from this more discovery writing perspective can be helpful with that, I think, because you're starting on page one, too, with the reader, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you're kind of peeling back the layers of the world as you go. Um, so that can be helpful, too. And and things like terminology comes into this, too, which I know has been <laughs> has been a difficulty in I find in reading a lot of fantasy and um, it's something that we notice a lot in like fantasy films too that we've watched is like when everything has some complicated name right even something very simple yeah every <laughs> every single thing has to be called something else yeah it's so confusing and it's it, I mean you can do this for a few things I think that are like really important or actually unique to your world but when it's like you're renaming like everyday things just to make it like more complex and layered, it quickly becomes very confusing, I think. Um, and also like renaming or just naming um, different places and, you know, maybe character groups or cultures or um, just different locations, <laughs> different cities or towns that the characters are going through. Like that can be done in moderation really well, but it can also become like very information overload right. <laughs> if you do it too much, I think. Uh, yeah, I think it's important to figure out what do you want to stand out? Yeah. Because whenever you're calling something something else that you've invented a word, it's going to draw attention and also time and energy to for the reader to understand, oh, okay, what is this thing? Let me learn. Yeah, it's like learning a language. Right, sort of. so you don't want to overwhelm your reader with too many things like, oh, okay, now, yeah. you know, like mug, light switch, and, you know, <laughs> the carpet. It's like those things that ask yourself, is it important for me to rename all those things? Or can I just draw my reader's learning energy to the few things that are like the yes. special elements? Right. What are the special things, like the special creatures, or this particular um, fantasy um, type of village or animal or um, something like that. So figuring out what are those special centerpieces mm. and things pertaining to them. Yeah. Like just ask yourself, why am I, why am I doing that? Yeah. And making sure that there's a good, meaningful reason behind it. So that way it's not like your reader is becoming mentally exhausted trying to remember, wait, what was that thing? I wish there was a little dictionary in the back of this book so I could go check, you know. So just avoiding mentally taxing the reader. Yes, absolutely. That's so important to remember. Um, and also, if you guys want to kind of springboard off this episode into another episode and dig deeper into the world building element, we have a episode all about world building. I think we did a couple, but the most recent one we will link in the corner or below in the description um, and check that out because we go deeper into world building and magic systems and cultures and different creating different um, fantasy worlds. And it's a it's something that doesn't necessarily just exist inside like deep fantasy, high fantasy. It can also be for other genres as well, like urban fantasy or um, magical realism, things like that. So there's a lot of different aspects to world building, even with the real world. If you're writing a yeah. story that takes place in the real world, you still have world building because you're building a world around the characters. So if you want to dive deeper into that, check out that episode for sure. Um, but yeah, to recap, Start with the characters, make them the centerpiece, make their internal conflict the most important focus of the story, and then expand from there. 
simplify your world building, make it something that you would want to read. Basically, write the book, write the fantasy book you've always wanted to read, the fantasy book of your dreams, that if you could take all the different elements that you love about other fantasies and put them into one story smoothie, what would that smoothie be? Write that instead of focusing on and obsessing over making sure that it's complex enough and layered enough and good enough and you know just as good as the other fantasy worlds that you've read. That's not as important as making sure you love it and you have fun writing it because that shines through the writing. Um, and then just trusting yourself, trusting that you do have original ideas. Your writing is unique. It's unique because you are writing it. And it's unique because you're bringing something to it that nobody else can do. And that's, that's going to shine through your work and you're going to be surprised by how many readers are out there eager to read a story just like this. There is an audience for it. There, even though, even if it's super niche, even if you feel like there's there's so many things about this book that make it like so specific, I don't know if anybody will like it as much as I do, I guarantee you there is an audience out there for this book and they will love it because they've always wanted it and have never been able to find it. So let that encourage you on your path, on your journey. And most of all, just find the fun, enjoy it, love yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Make Most it important play part. time. Yeah. And just experiment, try out yeah. some of the things we're saying and then springboard your own ideas. That's for me and Abby, that's what we've always done is it's all about exploring what yeah. works, what maybe something that worked for you before doesn't work now. Maybe something that worked for you in the past, you need to change it up. So like use this as a springboard and we hope you took some notes and you can use these things in your writing process to craft your own fantasy book your way mm -hmm. realizing that no one's going to be able to write this the way you're going to write it and it's as unique as you are so yeah be encouraged 100 percent. we're cheering if, you on and if you need um a, to plunge into an immersive world of writing mm -hmm. right now i just made a wonderful immersive writing session for fantasy writers it so. is the cool, it out. is my favorite so far. <laughs> Me too. It's so cool. It's like, so oh my gosh. Complex. You guys gotta go check it out. <laughs> There's so much to it. It's it's really fun because it like changes locations. It's like a medieval fantasy adventure and I got a ton of requests for it. So do you want to explain quickly how the immersive sessions work? Like, Yeah. So the immersive sessions are writing sprints basically. So you have a timer going in the background. It's built into the video but it's also music and immersive soundscapes. So it's like an ambient world that you kind of step into and the music goes with the mood and the soundscape goes with the location. And as you're writing, you see the timer going by on the screen with a progress bar and we go through four of those writing sprints. And for some of them, they change location for each writing sprint. So like this fantasy one is a fantasy adventure. And so it starts in the mountains for our first writing sprint, and then it transitions to a spooky mystical swamp, and then it transitions to a spooky dragon's cave um, with kind of more of a higher intensity music going. <laughs> and then finally we arrive in this medieval cozy fantasy village kind of at sunset and watch the sunset and the world gets darker and the stars come out. And it's like, a whole story sort yeah it's like so it's, cool it's like a little story arc like as someone who i watch like ambient videos all the time and listen to ambient like you know soundscapes and whatever but abby's like go to the next level of being <laughs> so immersive it feels like you're you've stepped into like this cinematic film but you're part of it i don't even know how to describe oh, it it's so <laughs> cool it's like its, it's own fun. experience you really need to go check Oh, Abby's immersive sessions. And she has other ones too. So if you're like, oh, I don't do fantasy, she has like one that's for like crime fiction yes. and mysteries and writing on a train. You have like one that's writing in a fantasy forest mm -hmm. and like yeah. another one, I think. Oh, yeah, writing in a, a beach cottage. Yeah, beach cottage. So many different uh, genres. Haunted Victorian mansion. Lots of different styles. Yeah, so Lots of there's, there's something for everybody. <laughs> yes. And I make them every month, so subscribe to my channel and you'll get a new one each month. They're super fun to make. I've, I've really enjoyed the process of making these. Abby puts sessions. a lot of heart into yes. them. <laughs> a lot of heart and extreme attention to detail. <laughs> like my favorite thing about the last one is when you're in the fantasy village, the moon actually rises. Yes. It's so cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I made the moon rise. That was pretty fun. Yeah, um, it just feels so realistic. Feels yeah. like you're there. <laughs> Thank I love you it. so much. Yeah, so I hope you guys enjoy that. If you're a fantasy writer, you probably are if you made it to this length 
of the video. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely check out that video. It will be linked in the description box below this video. Um, and if you're not on Kate's channel, check it out. Uh, youtube.com slash ka emmons all the podcast videos live on her channel as well as all of the amazing videos that kate posts and remember to check out kate's etsy shop to get these amazing mystical handmade candles they're so yes. cool candles will, for writers yes they will improve your writing sessions and just make you more creative with these lovely essential oils and yeah you'll love everything on kate's shop definitely go check it out um and Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for all of our wonderful, beautiful patrons. We so appreciate your support and your help keeping this podcast alive and free of interruptions. If you want to support the show and also join us for monthly hangout sessions, live streams each month, um, go to patreon.com slash the Kate and Abby show to help us keep this show going. We love you so much. Thank you for your support and your love and for watching, listening. Thank you guys so much for being here and until next time, stay stoked and rock on. <laughs>